I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And no, do not adjust your sets. That is not Cousin Shay. That is our good friend Stephen Lassen, senior editor over at Athlon Sports. Stephen, how's it going, buddy? Hey, Mike. It's good to be uh, back as always. It's a different day, but uh, still SEC after dark. Still excited to be talking some SEC ball. It's uh, it's middle of April, but hey, we've got a lot going on. Spring games, transfer portal. Uh, we're still hard at work on the Athlon Sports magazine, so uh, no off season here for college football. Yeah, no doubt. And once again, Stephen, I got to give you a particular shout out here because you came up with the show topic idea. We're going to cover the most important player for all sixteen SEC teams for the coming season, and we're gonna we're gonna have a little uh, caveat here because once we decided to to go with this uh, topic, Stephen and I were like, well. This is going to be 16 quarterbacks, isn't it? So (laughs) we're going to talk quarterbacks as well and just kind of rate their importance to the team, to the overall success. But we're going players that are not the quarterback just because this would be a silly list. This would just be 16. It may not be 16, but it'd probably be realistically 13 or 12 quarterbacks and a handful of other players. So we're doing the most important player that's not a quarterback, but still ranking the importance of every quarterback that we project or or we know at this point in time is going to be the starter for all 16 SEC teams. We also got transfer portal updates because, of course, this is the second portal window and, and portal madness is going crazy. But before we get to that, real quick, I just wanted to ask Stephen uh, if he had any particular takeaways from last weekend. We had it. I was going to call spring games, Stephen. We, we had about four or five, six spring games. We were supposed to have eight, but uh, some people decided to do a, a skills competition and a hot dog eating <laughs> thing. So uh, from what we were actually able to glean, did anything at all stand out about any of the teams or players? Mike, I don't know if you remember the uh, the old like NFL quarterback club that like the they used to have it on like the Game Boy the and they also used to have like the competition at the Pro Bowl like could we get that <laughs> in, in, like in replace of some of these spring games because it really has changed a lot there's just not a lot of action in some of these spring games but there were a couple things that caught my attention I think number one I was really impressed by Taylor Green at Arkansas uh, you know came into this off season he transferred in wondered if there was going to be a quarterback battle they pretty much put that to rest quickly. And I think if you're an Arkansas fan, you leave spring knowing that I think your structure offensively is better with Bobby Petrino. I also think you feel good about your quarterback development. I think we'll see what happens in SEC play when playing some uh, you know defense that have actually had time to scheme and it's not just set up to be kind of a friendly spring competition. But I think you're feeling pretty good if you're Arkansas at this point. Taylor Green was really impressive. I was also impressed by DJ Lagway. Uh, I think Florida's got two quarterbacks they can win with. We knew Graham Mertz from last season played really well. I expected DJ Lagway to be impressive, and he was uh, this spring as well. I thought, uh, and one other thought, I guess, continuing the quarterback theme, we, we think it's going to be a great year for quarterback play in the SEC. But uh, you know, Jalen Milrow, I, I know there was some ups and downs in the spring game, but I think you can see the kind of evolving uh potential for this offense and also I like the little improvements in the throwing motion it just seems like he's going to be once he gets settled into that offense um, Alabama un- under Kalen DeBoer will be just fine as expected so uh, I think quarterbacks uh, kind of dominated the the spring takeaways for me from Saturday right and then this upcoming Saturday of course so we'll have weather permitting I'm already seeing some of these spring games maybe uh, post you know canceled what have you but if weather permits, even Texas, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Mississippi State, and South Carolina, I believe that'll round us out for the entire spring in the SEC. So the action's not done quite yet. But, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Uh, Taylor Green, that, that was definitely – I mean, I, <laughs> we're, we're going to win 10 games now. I'm, I'm convinced that we got, we got it with, uh, with Taylor Green. But can't wait to see what he looks like in the fall Come with Bobby Petrino – calling the plays down there. But let's get into the uh, the action here, Stephen, with the transfer portal real quick. And I knew that um, – I knew news had happened because I got the text from Stephen. He said, uh-oh, Elijah <laughs> Harry in the portal. What is going on on Rocky Top? Um, you know, th- that was – I think to this point, I'm trying – I'm looking at my list here, Stephen. That was probably the biggest – name to enter the portal uh, and i'm just talking strictly from sec schools 
Um, I, and I, I do think that's a depth loss. I, I know he was leading the team in tackles last year, uh, and he would have played, a, I think, a big role. I don't think he would have started for Tennessee, but I think that's a loss, but, it, but it's not one that's going to kill Tennessee, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. I, I think it is surprising anytime you see someone who leads the team in tackles and you're not talking about like a, a G5 guy going to play at a P5 or somebody trying to move up from you know the ACC maybe to come into the SEC. But also I, I think if you from a depth perspective and also from where Tennessee is on defense, I don't think you want to be losing any of these guys. Like I, I agree with you. Like we think about Keenan Peely and uh, some of the other linebackers that Tennessee has, they're probably going to be fine there, but for a defense that is in transition on this in the secondary and just having depth and talent and you know, what happens if you lose someone like Keenan Peely, uh, like you did at the start of last season, you would have somebody stepping in there. So I think it's a depth loss, but also most importantly, I just think in a critical year for Tennessee on defense, you just don't want to be losing anybody who could really help you make an impact. So I think maybe that's where the, the biggest loss is for me uh, in, in Elijah Herring's uh, transfer. Right, but it, it could be some good news for the Vols too, Stephen, because you were just telling me that uh, one of the biggest names in the portal reportedly looking at Tennessee. Can you share that information? Yeah, uh, some of the reporting this afternoon on Damian Martinez, the Oregon State transfer at running back. I think he's one of the top 10 to 15 running backs in college football, um, over 1,000 yards at Oregon State last season. He's got, it looks like, a couple of SEC teams that are interested in his services. Uh, Kentucky, Mississippi State, and Tennessee have all been connected uh, with Martinez. And I think he is a, he is a go-to back. If, if any of these schools were to land him, I know Mississippi State and Kentucky have already landed transfers there this offseason, uh, but he's a guy who could give you over 200 carries and be a go-to running back. So uh, could be a pretty fascinating uh, search in the SEC for his services. I do think Miami's probably been uh, the team that's been connected with him the most in some of the rumor mill. So the SEC might be chasing the Hurricanes uh, for his services. Well, and what's interesting about that, Stephen, because the only thing that I've that I've really been informed of, and again, I don't know this is factual, but I, I've seen it has been reported that uh, Oregon State was prepared to give him a $400,000 NIL package. So if he said no to that, you say Miami's in the picture. That makes sense. But the, I mean, this <laughs> this could be, it's going to take a lot. You know, whoever he goes to, I, I will have to imagine as a strong NIL collective to, to land him. Uh, how about Arkansas? You know, they got hit kind of hard here, Stephen. Offensive lineman Andrew Champlay, we, we kind of knew that, that was pro that's where we were going. Running back Isaiah Augusta, he hit the portal right after the spring game, which was, which was wild. Quarterback uh, Jacoby Criswell, which, again, kind of figured that was going to happen because Taylor Green, breakout star. And then defensive end Jashad Stewart, uh, that was expected as well. But, you know, I, I hate to praise the Hogs on one hand and then kind of crap on them on another, but I'm looking at this list, Steve, and I, I feel like all these guys could have contributed this fall. I don't think you want to lose any uh, offensive or defensive linemen if you're Arkansas, especially someone like Chambly, who you know was like all SEC freshman last season, and certainly I think if you look at the advanced analytics, he had plenty of room to improve, but somebody who was starting as a freshman, get better as a sophomore and junior, kind of grow into that role, and I think the same thing is true on defense. I think at the position... It's much like Tennessee, I think, if you're Arkansas. You just don't want to lose anybody who could really be a contributor, even if it's just a depth piece. Offensive, defensive lines, you've got to have depth in the SEC to be able to win. So I, I don't think you want to lose guys like that. I will on the running backs though for Arkansas. I will take this this moment to talk about Jaquinta Jackson as a guy that I really like uh, when he was at Utah because in 2022, if you go back and watch some of the games for Utah, he looked like he was ready to be a superstar running back. He got hurt. Utah's offensive line was inconsistent last season, but he, I think he is a guy underrated pickup by Arkansas this offseason. Kind of forgot about from uh, what happened last year. So I know they're losing one, but I think to Quinton Jackson could be kind of an all sec type of player this year for Arkansas. Mm -hmm. All right. And then real quick, Steven, I'm going to just run down the list of guys from the sec that have uh, either entered the portal or reportedly will do so just in this second window. And a lot of backup players. Well, when I, when I get done with this list, you let me know if any of these guys are, you know, big losses for their team. A and M 
Lost safety uh, Jacoby Matthews and defensive back Sam McCall. Georgia running back Andrew Paul, receiver Tyler Williams, and offensive lineman Chad Lindbergh. LSU defensive end Jackson Howard. Texas offensive lineman Peyton uh, Kirkland. Auburn corner J.D. Rhyme. Defense alignment, Brenton Williams. Mississippi State, uh-oh, punter, Keelan Crimmins. He's, he's actually pretty solid. Safety, Trent Singleton. Defensive back, Luke Evans. Bama, oh no, Bama lost a kicker, Reed Harridan. And then uh, Kentucky, re- two receivers, Raymond Cottrell, who they got from A&M. Darius Cannon, and then running back, Lavelle Wright. Those are all the names I saw of SEC players that are hitting the portal in this second window. Any of those guys... Big losses. I don't think any huge losses. Uh, I did see uh, just before we started recording tonight that Derek Graham, the offensive line transfer from Troy, who went to A and M, is also back in the portal. So they lost some probably depth al- along the offensive line. A and M's done a good job of replenishing uh, some of their losses in the portal, and I'm sure they'll be active once again in this window. I think Jacoby Matthews probably the headliner. You've already seen like Oregon and Florida State have already tried to. Uh, reach out for his services. It sounds like he's going to be pretty coveted in the portal. I, I think uh, it's kind of one of those guys. Again, if you're a And M, he was you know what fifth on the team last year in tackles. Probably somebody in a in a year where you have a lot of transition, you'd like to have some stability on the back end. He's the name that jumped out to me. I think for Andrew Paul, I think more of a depth loss for Georgia, but maybe. Uh, with some of the kind of other injuries that Georgia has, maybe they look to the portal to maybe replace him with another depth piece at running back. That could be maybe kind of the domino effect of some of these losses. Right, and it's important to note, we've said it a couple times, but maybe someone missed it. You cannot jump in this portal if you're an SEC player currently and go to another SEC school unless they are a graduate transfer. So none of these guys that are hitting the portal can can transfer to another SEC school. But what that means, Stephen, is basically anybody else in the country that's jumping in the portal the SEC can go out there and grab. And, and I have heard this uh, period described as get your bids in now, SEC. <laughs> you know, like these SEC programs making their bids before these guys jump into the portal. So um, I, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, Stephen, but have there been any players around the country that have entered the portal here from, from outside the SEC that you think many SEC programs will kind of certainly be in contact with for the coming days? I think there are two names that come to mind right away. Keandre Lambert-Smith, the Penn State transfer, probably could have been an all-Big Ten receiver this season at Penn State. Uh, He opted to transfer. It sounds like, um, according to, I think it was on three or or 24-7, that Auburn, Georgia, and maybe Texas A&M had some contact with him already. So he could be a guy that's a top, you know, 30 receiver this year in college football who the SEC could be looking, uh, one SEC team could be looking to bring in. And I think Dayon Hayes is a uh, pass rusher defensive end from Pittsburgh. I would keep an eye on him because I think in this, you know, we, we talk about it all the time, Mike, you and I, if you're an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman that can play at a a high level, you are going to be coveted in the portal. He's a guy who was productive last year for Pitt. He transferred because he doesn't think their offense is probably going to be very good this year and doesn't think they're going to have a winning team. So uh, he's looking for a winner. And I think he, he could find some of those teams in the SEC if he wanted to come uh, play football in the South. Yep. All right, Stephen. So let's get into uh, our show topic again. We're going to hit on all 16 SEC teams like we love to do. You throw in a donation and, and let us know who your team is. We'll bump them up to the top of the list. Otherwise, we're going to just go in alphabetical order here. And we're going to talk about most important player for every team. And we're also going to talk about the level of importance of your starting quarterback, you know, because otherwise this list is just going to be nothing but quarterback. So uh, one out of five, how important a quarterback is, one being the least, five being the most. So let's go Alabama to start this thing off, Stephen. J- Jalen Milrow, how important do you think he is to Alabama's success this, this fall under uh, Kalen DeBoer? Mike, you can feel free to disagree with me on this one, but I think it's a five. I think on the scale of one to five, and of course I'm using five being the most important, I think in time, I think Austin Mack, especially with his experience in Kalen DeBoer's offense at Washington, Ty Simpson's uh, still at Alabama too. They have good depth there. 
I just think Jalen Milrow in this offense, if the the whole kind of passing ability comes together with a rushing ability, he's really going to have the dynamic type of season that could alleviate some of these concerns that Alabama has on defense coming into this year. So I th- I think he's ultra important. Uh, I gave him a five. Uh, feel f- Mike, feel free to call me crazy on that one. I'm calling you crazy, Steven. <laughs> I'm giving him a three, and I'll I'll explain myself here because. I mean, last year, let's call it what it is, Stephen. I mean, he was awful to start with, and he was elite by the end. So, again, they would not have made the run to the SEC. They would not have won the SEC championship without Jalen Burrow. But, I mean, I think even last year, they they proved they can win in spite of him. And I don't necessarily say that's, that's the case this year or anything like that, but he is just surrounded with so much talent that I think he can be inconsistent. I think they can lean on the ground game. Uh, obviously, he can run it. You know, so I, uh, again, I'm not saying he can just be a complete non-factor, but with the athletes they have all around him, I do not think Jalen Milrow is paramount. Now, maybe if they were to win a national championship, certainly he will be. But I don't even think that. Even the most diehard Alabama fan. Well, I was about to say maybe they don't expect. <laughs> they expect. They expect it. But I think it would be. If the, in their hearts or hearts, I think it would be a surprise to them if DeBoer won it in his debut season. They should be contenders, but if they win it all, it'll be because Jalen Milrow is elite. Uh, he'll need to be that. But for for kind of what the what their goals are, what their outlook is, you know, 10, 11 win team. I don't know. I I don't. I think Jalen Milrow can be about a three, and I think they could still potentially get there. I think my. Two of my reasons for going with him as a five, one would be defense. I don't want to read too much into the spring game because some of these games are set up to be like offensive showcases, but I think there have to be real concerns about the secondary for Alabama this year. If you're going to need to win high scoring games, I trust Jalen Milrow at this point way more than I do Ty Simpson or, or Austin Mack. Also, I think we saw this last year at Washington with Kalen DeBoer is that once the quarterback head coach, the Michael Penix DeBoer offense really settled in and took off quarterback driven, they leaned on him. Uh, We saw it with Kalen DeBoer when he was at Fresno State too with Jake Hayner. If you get a superstar quarterback, this offense can really take you places. So I I think I just have a lot more uh, confidence in him at this point and his dynamic all around ability uh, with the defensive concerns bumped him up to a five for me. So who do you have as the most important player for Alabama this fall? I wrestled with this one. I went with Malachi Moore at at safety. And for the reason I think you and I were just talking is the secondary is a real concern for Alabama. You've got transfers. You've got freshmen expected to start. You know, you need somebody on the back end of that defense who's played a lot of ball, who can be a communicator, who can get people lined up, even if it is a different defense this year. I don't think Malachi Moore would end up being first team all SEC, but I think with the losses that they have in the secondary, they're at least starting. They have one building block right now on the back end, and that's an experienced player in Malachi Moore. I also throw this out there. I considered Caden Proctor, too. I, it might seem crazy because he was up and down last year. Protecting the blind side for Jalen Milrow or another quarterback, uh, I think is going to be pretty important this year in this offense. Right. And, and, uh, you know, I almost went with more as well, Stephen, but I went with Tyler Booker, offensive lineman. He's already bought in as as one of the leaders of the team. I remember, you know, when Saban retired, he said, well, well, hell, I'm I'm not going anywhere. This is this is where I meant to be all that. We can say all these things, Stephen. We get waxed by Georgia. (laughs) We're going to need leaders to step up in a big time way. Uh, you know, uh, oop, threw up the wrong schedule here. We get waxed by Georgia. You know, who knows? At Tennessee, Mizzou, at LSU. Uh, you know, we, we're going to need a, a leaders to emerge even early in the season, Stephen. I mean, South Florida gave us troubles last year. I don't know, Wisconsin. I don't imagine they're, they threaten Alabama, but it is in Madison. Tough place to play. I think we need leaders. We need people that are bought into the football team. We need players to excel that that can show that it's you know not just Nick Saban that just buy, fully buy in to what Kalen DeBoer is selling. And I think that's what makes Tyler Booker one of the the most important player outside of the quarterback position for Alabama this fall. That's a good pick, Mike. Um, I, I think it's interesting that both of our picks are kind of um, almost leadership driven here with Malachi Moore and Booker. 
you mentioned something on the schedule and I, I'm not predicting an upset by any means, but you know, South Florida, <laughs> Alex Golish is the head coach. <laughs> and we, we remember what happened for Alabama secondary in Knoxville a few years ago. And here's a uh, revamped secondary going against a very dangerous South Florida offense in game two. So I think if anything, if you're Alabama, you catch Western Kentucky in week one, a team that's in a bit of a transition, but you also get two tests, South Florida, Wisconsin, before you play uh, Georgia. So obviously this that's a great case for guys like Tyler Booker, Malachi Moore, for that senior leadership really to come through before the big one against Georgia. Right. All right, Stephen, I'm not seeing any donations, so we'll just stick with uh, alphabetical until, until someone donates here. But let's go Arkansas. Importance. Taylor Green, we've already talked a little bit about him, but importance of their transfer quarterback for the Razorbacks this fall. I went with four. If you would have asked me before the spring game, I probably would have had that number a little bit lower. Trying not to read too much into spring game performances, but I think there's sort of a sort of a chain of thought here that Bobby Petrino always usually gets good quarterback play. He kind of handpicked Taylor Green and his skill set with the mobility. We saw this last year. He did uh, the work that he did with Jalen Henderson at Texas A&M. I think there's a lot to like here with the way that he closed out spring practice. So I went with him as a four. They also just lost Jacoby Criswell, too. So I think that uh, takes away an experience backup uh, for now for Arkansas. Well, hey, I, I, I like disagreed with you, Stephen. I'm going five for Taylor Green because I think he is critically important for the Razorbacks to have success. And really, I guess kind of the way I was looking at not necessarily all these teams, but certainly Arkansas, if they are to exceed expectations, I think it's going to be because of that Taylor Green uh, being a breakout star in the SEC, playing, of course, for Bobby Vitrino in this offense. So I, I just think his... You know, if Arkansas, a lot of people are just expecting them to disappoint for Sam Pittman to be gone. And if Taylor Green, if this is all hype and there's no substance to it, that's what's going to happen. So I just think he's critically important. And we all know if you got a quarterback, you have the opportunity to compete in this conference. Uh, I, I think more often than not, unfortunately, Arkansas, you're talking 1-85. to They're going to be at a talent disadvantage to many of the SEC teams they face. Uh, let me throw up their schedule there. But they can close that gap with elite offense. I think they're going to have to outscore some people. And if Taylor Green is that breakout player, which it's starting to look like he is, uh, you know, I think you can catch it maybe an A&M, maybe, uh, you know, at Auburn, at Mississippi State. These are teams that, w- that beat you last year. Uh, Texas, Ole Miss at home, LSU at home. If you're going to beat a team or two on here that the very few – I've got you beaten. It's going to be, I think, because Taylor Green. Yeah, and not to mention, too, I like the fact that he's got the mobility for an offensive line that is going to be under construction early and probably during the season. You have somebody who can help sort of mitigate uh, some of those offensive line concerns. The only reason why I didn't go with him as a five is I just like I gave Milro the five because I think he's like I just think he's a better player. And we haven't seen Taylor Green do it at the SEC level, albeit what he did Saturday was pretty impressive. And he was a solid starter at uh, at Boise State, just a little bit up and down as a passer. But I think certainly in this offense under Bobby Petrino, I think we should see him take off. Right. All right. So who's your most important player for the Razorbacks next fall? I'm going to go with one uh, a defensive lineman that I think is underrated in a big way nationally, and that is Landon Jackson. I think we saw the growth last season for Landon Jackson. Um, you know, he was kind of playing at an All America, All SEC caliber level in his second year at Arkansas last season. I, th- I think when you look at this defense too uh, for Arkansas next season, they lose Jaheim Thomas, they lose Chris Paul, they're losing a lot of guys at linebacker. That's a spot that's got some turnover. They need guys who can be difference makers on this defense. And Landon Jackson is for sure one of those. So he's my most important Razorback for 2024. Now, I cheated a little bit because I kind of knew this is where you're going, Steven. So I wanted to be a little bit different. Nothing wrong with that selection. Landon Jackson, Of course, I agree everything you just said. But how about tight end Luke Hawes, who Bobby Petrino has already said is going to be Taylor Green's best friend next season, the check down guy. He's going to go to him early. He's going to go to him often. And on third downs, you better have Luke Haas covered because if you don't, he's probably going to go convert on you. And I, I know it was early in the season, but he was making 
impact plays for the Razorbacks as a true freshman. He's making these plays once again in spring. And I think he is potentially an all-conference type selection. So, again, going with my theme, that I, th I think Taylor Green and the offense is going to be paramount. He's got a couple weapons, but I think the best one could be Luke Haas, breakout year two in college football. Uh, give me Arkansas start. They, they used to be tight end you down there. I, I think they're, they're going to bring some of that back with Luke Haas. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think on the same the same line of thinking as Landon Jackson is, I think Lucas is very underrated and largely because he was just hurt most of last season. But also, you averaged sixteen, almost sixteen yards per catch in your first you know five games last season, and also with the struggles that this offense had uh, all, all last season. I mean, they need somebody who can take it, the middle of the field, can be a reliable weapon for your quarterback. Um, so I, I think that's a big. It's big for Arkansas to get him back healthy in the lineup to help stretch the field. And also I think this receiving core for Arkansas, you get Andrew Armstrong coming back and a couple other guys. He could really, I think, take some of the pressure off of those guys on the outside too. So just an all around really important piece to add to the puzzle for Arkansas. Hey, shout out cousin Rick. He just gave us 20 bucks. He's a big Aggie. So as Mizzou will learn in the fifth game, the Aggies best players are the hundred thousand twelve Ben at Kyle Field. I love it. So let's do Texas A&M next, Stephen, before we get to uh, their, their most important player. What, and, and we're assuming Connor Wigman is going to be their starter. I mean, Elko's kind of come out and said that, hey, going into spring, he was our number one. So let, let's just go with, with him for now. I know they've, they've got a talented and, and what few SEC teams have. They actually have depth at the quarterback position. But great Wigman, his, his impact – his importance for the Aggies is fall one to five. I gave him a three. It might be a little high because I do have a lot of confidence in Jalen Henderson. And also I was impressed by Marcel Reed in the bowl game against Oklahoma state. Like you said, Texas A&M has some depth at quarterback. That's something that a lot, not a lot of teams have now in the portal era. I think they have at least two starters. They should probably feel good about and probably with a little bit more development, uh, Marcel Reed would make that three. So I, I gave Wigman a three largely because I'm anticipating him having a big jump this year, and I kind of think he's going to have that breakout season. So I, that's why he's probably a little bit high in, in my rating. <laughs> yeah, they're battling in the comments. Mizzou at a and I love it. I, I, I think hey, you said something interesting there, Stephen. You said you gave him a three, but you said I, I think it should, might be lower. I'm going with a two because I, I agree with you. I mean, again – uh, this is, this is no disrespect to, to Wigman, but I, this is more about, uh, our new offensive court coordinator, Colin Klein and his ability to work with the pieces he has. And again, I, I think he'll find creative ways to get playmakers, the ball. So I, I just don't think this is going to be the Connor Wigman show. Now I could be completely wrong, but especially him coming back from, from injury, you know, we, we've had such horrible luck, Steven, with quarterbacks getting injured seemingly every year in college station. So we got to do a lot to, to correct that issue and protect Wigman and, and maybe not have him run as much as, as we'd like to initially. So I'm giving him a great two. That this doesn't mean he's a bad player, but it, it really what it's to me says, Stephen is I think they got good offensive coaching for the first time in, a, in seven, eight years. Uh, and they got talent around him. So they, they're just not going to need him to carry the football team, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think you could also feel just feel good about Jalen Henderson just saying he can win you games uh, but the way that he played at the end of last season. So all of those factors, and it sort of brings you know kind of to the most important player. I kind of wonder if maybe an offensive lineman needs to be an imp one of the most important <laughs> players here for Texas A&M because keeping Connor Wigman healthy is going to be the priority this season. And this is a group that has struggled uh, albeit they have a much better coaching staff now on the offensive side of the ball. So who is your most important Aggie then? I did consider an offensive lineman. Uh, eventually, I kind of shifted gears. I went to the defensive side of the ball. I went with Shamar Turner, uh, so another defensive lineman that I think is kind of underrated in the SEC. Ten and a half tackles for a loss, six sacks last season. I think he needs to be even better. With Walter Nolan, McKinley Jackson, those guys are gone. Um, they've been looking for some defensive line help in the portal. They've already brought some in. He's got to be a difference maker for them this season. And Mike Elko needs tone setters on that side of the ball. I think Shamar Turner could be one of them to sort of help table set uh, a Texas A&M defense that could be much improved with Mike Elko leading the way. 
Yeah, I love that selection, and I almost went with it, but uh, I'm going to go with uh, our buddy Cousin Kyle here. I, I think it's uh, York at linebacker. I mean, just a br- breakout player. And now, Shamar Turner, I mean, he's <laughs> he's sensational as well. They, and you make good points where the losses they've had, they may need him to be even better. So s- certainly Turner could be the option there, but – York, they just named him a team captain. He got emotional. I don't know if you saw that video, Stephen. It was pretty cool. But, uh, you know, we we need this Mike Elko defense to to kind of return to form that it was when he was defensive coordinator just a couple years ago. I think, you know, they took a step back the last couple years under DJ Durkin. Thankfully, he's gone. He's down the road at Auburn. Now we're back to the Mike Elko era, which was, uh, you know, they had some elite linebackers during that time. So, I, I don't know that there's a wrong answer. I, I'm certainly not saying your answer is wrong. I Shamar Turner was my number two, so I, I'm right there with you on his level of importance. But uh, I, I'd like to see York continue his uh, transition to be perhaps one of the best linebackers in the SEC. That's probably a better pick than mine. I uh, probably should have picked York. Shame on me uh, for not <laughs> picking uh, York. I, I think you think about his importance and with, the, with Edge Cooper off to the NFL – and this is also a position that A&M has had question marks about the last couple of years. It seems like they've been trying to take guys in the portal to fill depth. They're trying to find a starter. They're doing that this offseason. And, you know, you just look at the simple stat sheet. York is by far their most proven productive linebacker uh, with Cooper off to the NFL. So a guy that I think, you know, we talked about Shamar Turner, but Tori and York also probably a guy who's going to have a uh, kind of all SEC caliber season under this defensive staff. Right. All right, Steven. So uh, no donations. Anybody want to bump their team to the top of the list? Hit us with a, any kind of donation. But until then, Steven, let's stick it in alphabetical here. Let's go Auburn. What grade would you give Peyton Thorne for his importance for Auburn this fall? I went with three. I struggled with this one because I think there's a clear ceiling under Peyton Thorne. I do think he can be better this year. I think his supporting cast, especially with Cam Coleman, I think all that's going to help him. But also, I think there is a bit of a ceiling. And also, I think if he's not your starter, you get an extended look at Walker White or Hank Brown or one of the other younger quarterbacks on the roster. So uh, three, I think he's solid. I think at this point, he seems to be Auburn's best option. Right. And (laughs) Steve, we're going to agree to disagree once again. (laughs) And again, maybe my method is a little flawed here, Stephen, but I went four. I think his his importance – not that I think he's an elite player. I mean, I've kind of made that clear. I don't, I don't like to sit here and bash guys. Hopefully he takes a year two jump in the SEC. But I think he was kind of holding them back last year. So, again, I if we're expecting Auburn to take a big jump with these new pieces, some freshmen, they attack the portal as well. Uh, they, need, they really need him to take a step up. If they're going to win eight, nine, ten games this year, he cannot be the player he was last year. So I, I think he is vitally important. And I know they're kind of high on some of the younger guys they have, but what we've seen of Peyton Thorne, at least we we know what we're getting. I, I, these younger guys, I don't think we've got a clue what what any of these guys can do. And and I don't know. I've got, not saying they can't do it, Stephen, but I've got zero confidence in any of them to win a SEC football game just because they've not been in the situation. So I think Pey- give me a four for Peyton Thorne. I think he's vitally important, and that's. Sadly, again, I'm I'm trying not to I'm trying to be as kind as I can here. People are catching on that I hate Auburn now, but it, not as, personally, but just just how they project this year. But that that's kind of gives you an indication of, of why I'm down on them because I just don't know that Peyton Thorne can can carry them to glory if that makes sense. SEC Mike always been a big Auburn Peyton Thorne believer. It's always showing <laughs> this right. <ranking. laughs> so, so who's your most important Tiger this fall? I'm going to go with someone who's going to make Peyton Thorne's job a lot easier, and that is Cam Coleman. Uh, I just think that his ability to stretch the field, to be a difference maker in the passing game, we saw the issues that this receiving core had last season. Quarterback, receiver, not on the same page, drop passes. I just think that Cam Coleman could be a real difference maker from the jump uh, and somebody who could really spark this passing game. So I went kind of maybe a little bit unconventional. I went with the true freshman. Right, and hey, Stephen, we agree on this one. I, I went exactly the same with you. Cam Coleman, breakout star, is all we heard in the spring. He validated that in the spring game a couple weekends ago. And, and you're right. Maybe this is why Peyton Thorne 
you know, has a lot better season because he's got these weapons around him. And I mean, <laughs> I hate to put too much pressure on a freshman, Stephen, but they're calling him Megatron and, uh, you know, all these other Randy. I heard Randy Moss. I mean, I, I <laughs> let's pump the brakes on all that. But, <laughs> you know, the way the schedule lines up again, I'll throw it up one more time. But I mean, they have an opportunity to kind of get him going against Alabama, A&M, Cal, New Mexico, and Arkansas, you know, you can't do much easier than that in the SEC to start a football season. So that'll be a nice acclimation period for Cam Coleman. Uh, I, I think he's one of the biggest breakout stars in the SEC this year as a, among true freshmen. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I just think you, we've already seen him in an SEC setting. I know it was a spring game, but every – spring you know report practice report spring game it was how impressive that he was and also you throw in robert lewis the georgia state transfer it feels like auburn is going to have a much improved uh receiving core this year which should make peyton thorne's job um a little bit easier and and help raise that ceiling it's also i think as we're kind of talking here it's also brings us back to the transfers that's why if i'm auburn i'm going all in on keandre lambert smith to try to get him to to auburn because if you could throw him out there i know they're kind of high in the Sam Jackson, the Cal transfer, who's now playing uh, receiver. He played quarterback there. Uh, all of a sudden, this receiving core looks a lot different if you can get another difference maker. All right. Uh, again, hit us up with a donation if you want your team to jump to the top of the list. Otherwise, we're going to go in alphabetical. But let's go Florida, Stephen. Graham Mertz, his value to Florida this fall, fall on a scale of one to five. Where do you rank, rank him? I went with one. Ooh. And it's not because I think he's a bad player. I just think DJ Lagway was so impressive uh, for me in the spring game. But it's not just that. It's just that it's the five-star potential. It's what we've seen on the recruiting tapes and highlights and the evaluations. If Mertz had to miss a game, I think Florida would be fine with DJ Lagway. Mm. Well, <laughs> I hate to agree with you, Stephen, but I kind of do. I, I went two because I, I still think he's a, he's a fine player. But kind of my logic, Stephen... Again, he was not elite by any measure, but he was significantly better than what I thought he was, and yet Florida still struggled. So, I mean, I think he's going to be even better, but to your point, I don't know that they need is a strong word, but I, I think the point is, you know, let's we don't like to project injuries or anything, and, and to my knowledge, it's not like he's injury prone, but if he misses a game or two, I don't think there's going to be any level of panic because they have DJ Lagway. In fact, some fans will probably be called for, you know, if DJ Lag, Lagway wins whatever game he starts, you know, they'll be, they'll be saying, well, we got to keep him in there, right? So to your point, I, I put him as a two because, I again, I, I don't think anything they do, uh, anything he does, excuse me, is, is going to def- dictate how they're going to do it. To me, it's mostly about the defensive side of the football. Yeah, the, and I and we talk about um, most most important players here for Florida. I wrestled with a couple defenders uh, because of how important they could be. But I think you know, in, in the very broad scheme for me, when I look at Florida, I've kind of been buying into this kind of idea that they might be a little bit better. I think than most people are going to think this preseason. I know their schedule is difficult, but I think it's the offense that gives you a lot of optimism. They may not be able to stop a lot of teams, but I think they're going to be pretty sneaky good uh, once again on, on offense this year. And if they can pick up some of those wins in swing games at home early, they really have a chance to kind of build some momentum before the schedule gets really difficult later in the year. So uh, apologies, Steven. I don't, I don't think you revealed who's your, who's your top player. I was trying to buy some time because I need <laughs> <laughs> you won't be. I can go first. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Now. I think I almost went Eugene Wilson. Cause I think that is, again, he's, he's a breakout candidate. He could be an all American type player. I know he, he got a little banged up last year. I believe missed a little bit of time, but when he was healthy, uh, I just, I, I still have nightmares of what he did to Tennessee's uh, defense there. So he makes all the sense in the world. If, if we're just saying the best player, he's probably the best player. Monshell Johnson could be another candidate, but little curveball, Stephen. I'm going defensive back corner, Jason Marshall. And, and again, I don't think he's the best player, but they were just so god awful on defense, and particularly in the secondary, they have they need some leadership. They need someone to emerge there. He's back. He started, I believe, the last two years. I think he started 12 games each of the last two seasons. So, uh, veteran, new defensive backs coach. 
not a new defensive coordinator or anything, but we need some stability there. We need someone to emerge because, again, let's say Graham Mertz is an All-American. Let's say Montreal Johnson is All-SEC. Let's say Eugene Wilson wins the Heisman. I mean, none of that's going to happen. But let's just say it does. If the defense doesn't take any strides, they're probably going to go 4-8. and eight. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it, it rusts on the defense to do something here. We cannot be as awful as we were. So I, I just tried to pinpoint someone that has played a lot, who has been questionable at times. But as, if they step up, if they become a, a leader, if they become a key player, could spark a turnaround in Gainesville. I feel better because my two picks were the same as yours and they were Eugene Wilson and Jason Marshall. And I've been going back and forth this whole show, <laughs> figure out which one I like more. I, I thought it was interesting to to look at uh, Jason Marshall's numbers on pro football focus, because what they said was, you know, he, he gave up fewer receptions last year than he did in 2022, but when he gave them up, they were bad. They were either touchdowns or big plays. So I think in terms of most important if you can get him to play at an all SEC level and play like a lockdown corner, um, that shores up one side of the ball. And with the question marks they have about the pass rush and the new faces on the defensive line coming into the year, I think he's got to be your most important player. Get Jason Marshall back on track and help your secondary. And of course, in turn, help this defense and help Florida try to get to a bowl game this year. Yeah, and Liquid Flames, big Florida fan, he says, or... The entire special teams, which I mean, that, was, that was that could have been a good one too. You know what? Just trying to get eleven on the field, right? <laughs> all right. How about uh, Georgia, Stephen? Let's let's do Carson Beck first of all. Uh, scale of one to five, how important is Carson Beck in your opinion to Georgia's success? I went with a three. I think it could be one or two lower, just because I think Gunnar Stockton. If he had to play for a couple weeks for Georgia, I think Georgia would be fine. But I also think you can make a case that, hey, Carson Beck might be the best returning quarterback in college football this season. So that has to count for something. So I've got him as three in my ratings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went with two, Stephen. Again, this is that's not an indictment on Carson Beck. Uh, it's just that the talent around him, it's Gunnar Stockton, like you said. Uh, now, in key moments, perhaps. You know, we'll, we'll need Carson Beck. He can't be average. I thought he was, you know, made some mistakes, obviously, in the Alabama game, and it cost him. But I, I wouldn't put that all on him. I think it was more about stopping Alabama in critical situations, not being able to run the ball when they needed to at times. So, again, that might be a, a weird ranking because I think Carson Beck is going to be in the Heisman race all season long. But I don't know that he is, uh, you know, truly impactful unless – the only way he could be truly impactful in a, in a, is in a negative light. Like if he, for whatever reason, uh, just you know goes backwards and costs Georgia some football games. I mean, I I think the people are gonna be stunned if they're ten and two. You know what I mean? So I think eleven and one, twelve and zero is the expectation. So I, it, it may not be fair to say this, Stephen, but I but it, I don't know how important Car Carson Beck is to that because I think. We, we kind of know what we're getting with him, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think we do. And also, I think you mentioned clutch moments. And I think back to how effective he was in that game against Auburn early in the season. He kind of grew up in that game, and it felt like that's when Georgia's confidence level and Carson Beck started to grow. So I, I do think there is the element of, hey, he's delivered in the clutch already. And so if you go, let's just say on the road to Texas or Ole Miss, and you have to go with Gunnar Stockton, I think Georgia's they're, I don't know if they're favored against Texas, but I think they're probably favored against Ole Miss, or at least the spreads are close. You know, it gets a tight game, and you have a first-time starter on the road as opposed to Carson Beck. I, I think there is a little bit of a difference there. I think I'd much rather have Carson Beck. But overall, right. I think Gunnar Stock would be plenty effective in this offense. I mean, I'm just looking at their schedule. You're right, Stephen. At Bama, at Texas, at Ole Miss. God forbid Gunnar Stockton has to start the, you know, I think the rest they <laughs> they would win, yeah, and probably win handily. Yeah, you know, I yeah. mean, that's just that's just kind of how I see it. Now things can change, but uh, how about the most important dog for you, Stephen? Because again, I don't, we could go many different ways here. I'm going to go with Michael Williams, at defensive end slash Jack linebacker, wherever he fits in uh, this season. But if, if you want to be like super picky about Georgia, you know, last season the defensive, you know, rush defense kind of regressed. They didn't get after the quarterback as much. You know, Kirby Smart has always talked about it. it's not necessarily about the sacks and the tackles for loss. It's about the havoc. 
Well, I think Georgia can create more havoc this season. And it'll be interesting to see a player of his caliber. We've seen the flashes. Can he kind of put it together for a full season? Because if he can, in this new role, in theory, Georgia's getting after uh, the quarterback a little bit more, creating some more havoc. So I think Michael Williams creating more havoc, di- defensive difference, uh, disruptor, kind of my most important player. Yeah. And Dell just wants you to know, Stephen, hotty tidy. Georgia's going down Ole Miss this year. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, the confidence. Huh? <laughs> how about this one? This again, this might throw you for a loop here, Stephen. But I went Trevor Etienne, <laughs> and you know it sounds like he may have to miss the first game. But you know we have been missing a big time running back the last couple seasons at Georgia, and not that that's really hurt them. I mean they they nearly went three in a row here. But I just think the fact they they went out there and got him, it says something to. The fact that they believed they were missing this part of their offense. And again, um, I could be mistaken, Stephen, but, you know, not that they need any motivation down there in Athens, but when you pluck someone away from a struggling SEC program and you insert them into a ready made champion, and we heard, we've, we've even heard it from Trevor Etienne that, you know, I, why did I leave? Well, I didn't want to be on a losing team, and I, I want to win a national championship. So the, the, the fact that he will be driven in perhaps his only season, who knows, maybe he'll play two years down there, but if all goes according to plan, he probably only plays one season, he's off to the NFL. I think he'll be, as long as he doesn't get suspended again, I think he'll be very, very motivated to make the most out of this money year this championship run that Georgia's about to go on. So give me Trevor Etienne to give Georgia a little bit of what they didn't have last year, which is, you know, it's kind of unbelievable to say because they they nearly did it all again. That's a good pick, Mike. I mean, if you look at what Georgia lost at running back, you lose Diwan Edwards, you lose Kendall Milton. Um, Roger Robinson is back this year, but we talked about it earlier. They lost Andrew Paul, so they've lost a little bit of depth at the position. But make no mistake about it, you know, Trevor Etienne is being brought in to be the guy, the difference maker at running back, adding another difference maker to an offense that's already got plenty of weapons at receiver, but also his ability to catch the ball of the backfield to kind of be a safety valve for Carson Beck. So um, I think positional, you know, running back's not high in the positional important list for me, but when you have a special one, potentially like ETN, um, I think that pick makes uh, all the difference in the world. All right. How about Kentucky, Steven? Uh, again, let's do the quarterback real quick. Brock Vandegrift. Didn't get to see him in a, in a spring game, unfortunately, other than some highlights and all that. But rate his importance for Kentucky next fall. I think it's a five. Uh, there's just there's just no kind of other proven entity behind uh, Brock Vandegrift at quarterback. I mean, Kentucky is bringing him in to be the starter. You know, they, they've added some guys in recruiting in the transfer portal for depth. But it seems like to me, Kentucky is all in on Brock Vandegrift. So he has to be a five uh, in this exercise. I think I agree a hundred percent, Stephen. I mean, it's again, if, if he's, which he's not, but if he's Devin Larry 2.0, we got problems. We got real problems. Yeah. And again, I hate to, to bash a guy, but you know, that was, there was a lot of hype and, it, and not a lot of substance to that. And Brock Vandegrift, obviously the five-star billing, all the hype. This is their guy. I mean, they basically named him the starter the day he transferred in. So, yeah. and, and he's, well, apparently he's looked apart. What little we've seen of him in action, he's looked good. Uh, but it's time for him to live up to show what he can do. He may be a one and, and done to the NFL, but I th- this this could be the biggest pickup. I know it was a big deal when it happened, but, I, but we kind of move on from all that. This could be the transfer edition of the of the entire offseason in the SEC. Brock Vandegrift to Kentucky. It's it's interesting because it almost feels like it has like the widest variance of like outcomes right now, just because mm-hmm. we don't have a lot of like known tape on Brock Vandergriff. If he's really good, Kentucky could surprise. If he's just okay, like you said, Devin Leary, um, you end up with another kind of middle of the road season for Kentucky, maybe struggling just to get bowl eligible. So uh, I think just based upon positional importance, the depth behind him. Uh, what he's being brought in to do for Kentucky and the the variance of outcomes you could get if you don't have him. Uh, to me, he's probably, I think he's one of the more important transfers for sure of this offseason. I don't know, you know, we'll see what his impact is, but just importance, he's got to be up there. Right. And then, so who do you have as the most important wildcat this fall outside of the quarterback position? 
I hate to use the term underrated defensive lineman, but I'm going to do it again. And that is Dion Walker. It's just interesting to me that Tennessee, Arkansas, and Kentucky might have three of the best defensive linemen in the SEC next season. And, you know, does Alabama have a first team uh, all SEC defensive lineman? It's just kind of a rare uh, season. But, you know, you, you think back to the strength of Kentucky's defense last year was stopping the run uh, 3.6 yards per carry in SEC games. Walker was a big reason why. I think kind of a quiet superstar uh, for Kentucky. So give me Deion Walker. Yeah, that's a great pick, Stephen. He's going to be on my all-SEC first-team ballot at media days. I mean, I, he may be the best interior defensive lineman that we have in this conference, if not the country. So uh, no no disagreements there. But I went a little different. I went receiver Barry and Brown, kick returner extraordinaire, coming into his junior season, kind of a money year for him. His catches went down his sophomore year, only 43 catches. He had 50 as a true freshman. We got to get him going, get that rapport Rolling with Brock Vandergriff. And if we can get Barry and Brown, obviously we got Dane Key, got a number of uh, young receivers ready to step up. But uh, I think if this this offense is going to do what they, they're going more up tempo, they're going quicker, that's going to give us more one on ones, more opportunity to catch his defenses napping a little bit. Give me Barry and Brown because I, th- I think he's going to be instrumental not only on offense, but special teams, which is an area where Kentucky can, can kind of close the gap on a team or two in the SEC that they may not be expected to beat. That's a good pick, Mike. Did you consider any offensive linemen for Kentucky in this spot? Yeah, but uh, I probably would have went Gerald Mincy if that was the case, and just because I don't know if he's going to hit or hit or not. He's, he's been kind of inconsistent. But the way he's talking, Stephen, I think Gerald Mincy's got something to prove this fall, particularly when they play Tennessee. So, uh, he's kind of the first one that pops out to my mind when it comes to Kentucky's offensive line. It was almost going to say whoever starts at left or right tackle this season, like however that breaks down for Kentucky, just trying to get that big blue wall back together. But I, you know, Dane Key and Barry and Brown can be two of the most kind of exciting you know, receivers to watch in the SEC. And you throw in Jamori Macklin, the transfer they brought in from North Texas, big playability too. So Kentucky's got a nice trio of receivers. It all like comes back to Brock Vandergriff and whether or not he hits this season. Yep. All right. How about uh, LSU, Stephen? How would you rate Garrett Nussmeyer scale one to five, his importance for the Tigers this fall? I went with four. And I think if you if you take away Garrett Nussmeyer, it'd either be Ricky Collins or AJ Swan. I, I think if you're LSU, you you probably feel okay about that for a game. But I think Nussmeyer has been impressive. He's been impressive in limited time. He's been impressive this spring. And I don't expect their numbers offensively to match what they did last season. But I think based upon what we know about Nussmeyer, I think they can keep that offense near the top of the SEC. So I went with four. Steven, I agree with you, but I got to interrupt real quick. Cousin Darwin's got a comment. He says, Arch Manning will be better than Eli or Peyton in Cal. I mean, what are we basing this on? I mean, recruit rankings, not being in a video game. How in the world? What are the what are the odds, Steven? Peyton Manning, Eli Manning. I mean, two, I don't know if they're both in the Hall of Fame yet in the NFL. They they will be soon, but they're. I think they're both in the college hall. I mean, they're just arguably the two best players at their schools. What are the odds? Steven's the most level-headed guy I know. What are the odds? And you know that Arch is better than than both of them. Probably pretty small, right? <laughs> I mean, you'd have to think. I mean, Peyton, Peyton's pretty special. Um, you know, I think Arch is going to be good, but he could be Steven, He could be a two-time All-American. He could still not be better than them. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. That's true. I I mean, I think he's going to be a. a a good quarterback in time, but uh, better than Peyton. That seems, that seems hard to do. Darwin, he says 80%. So he's back. He's okay. already backing down a little bit. He's we'll get him there. I, I, I love the off season <laughs> optimism, right? <laughs> but yeah. All right. Sorry. Back to regularly scheduled pro. I think you nailed it with, with Garrett Nussmeyer four. He, he's going to be vitally important. Uh, he's important to the roster, but he is also surrounded with talent. I, I'm starting to come around more and more and more on Garrett Nussmeyer and I, I, fingers crossed, Stephen, again, you, we can get fooled in the spring. But uh, losing their offensive coordinator, I, I think at Mike Denbrock, he was excellent for LSU. So that is something that I think we could we could be looking back at the fall and say, man, we, we didn't realize what a big deal that was. So fingers crossed, that's not a big deal. But uh, I, I, Garrett Nussbauer, I think it'll be vitally important given that, don't forget, I mean, Jane Dales, 
I could have this mistaken, but I think he led the SEC in rushing too. I mean, how will LSU make up for this lost production in the running running game? That that is something that uh, you know they're probably going to have to throw the ball a lot more. But that that is something to consider this fall with with how much uh, Garrett Nussmeyer's really got to make up with Jane Daniels off to the NFL. Yeah, D- Jaden Daniels was second in the SEC with 94.5 rushing yards a game. Cody Schrader was first. So, yeah, I mean, not only through the air and how dynamic he was, but now you're talking about trying to generate more of a ground game for a team that, you know, they've had some turnover at running back too. So a way, way different uh, situation on offense for LSU. And, oh, by the way, you like you said, you lost Mike Dimbrock, uh, one of the best um, offensive coordinators in the country. This is going to be an interesting year uh, right. for LSU. So who's the most important tiger outside of the quarterback position? I went with Harold Perkins. Um, I did consider Will Campbell as well, just because I think if you're one of the top offensive linemen returning in college football, you probably deserve a, a spot in this list. But I think for, for LSU's defense to get back on track, I think certainly part of that is it's got to be the secondary. You know, they got to get back to being that sort of turnkey operation where they churned out uh, high level defensive backs year after year. But Harold Perkins, the, the situation last year, they moved him around, didn't quite work out. Now he's back, uh, moved back with Blake Baker. So I think just getting him back to be an all SEC type of, of difference maker for LSU's defense could really be one check in getting this defense back on track. Yeah, hey, that, that's exactly where I went as well, Stephen. Playing for Blake Baker, we know how aggressive he likes to be. He likes to bring the pressures from all over. We have got to find a way to utilize Harold Perkins in a, in a better fashion then what we, I mean, we, we got to stop putting them in coverage. I mean, that, that would be lesson number one for Brian Kelly. Uh, I don't know what in the world they're doing with that. But uh, if LSU is going to take that big step on defense, again, I, and I think it's way too much to ask for them to be a top 25 defense. And that used to be the expectation. But given how awful they've been, you know, being in the top 50 would be an achievement. That's only going to come, I think, if they utilize – the talent they have, and it all starts with Harold Perkins. He, He's probably still the best. He, I think he's been the best player on the team, um, short of maybe Jane Dales, but he's not been utilized. He's not had those opportunities, and they really got to showcase this fall what Harold Perkins can do. And you can also – one other thing we should note on the transfer thing too is LSU is uh, – offered seems like they're interested in 300 pound defensive tackles like everybody uh this transfer portal cycle but a couple of those guys could make harold perkins job a lot easier too by eating up some of those blocks and being able freeing him up uh to create pressure so what lsu does in the portal maybe to add some depth could also help uh perkins get back to that all kind of all america type level we thought he would be last season right all right how about uh old miss Stephen? where are you going with the level of importance jackson dart has this fall for them I went with four only because I think Walker Howard could also be fine. Um, all I will say about Jackson Dart is I really like the development from last from 2022 to 2023. And with Quinshaw Judkins transfer, I think even more is going to be on his plate this year. So I've got him at four. I guess I could be convinced to put him at a five too. Oh, interesting. I, I went a little lower. I went three, which I, I see why you went that way. Uh, again, I think what, it's unproven depth, but we have depth potentially behind him, uh, at least until players potentially hit the portal, which I, <laughs> I don't know that they will, but you just never quite know. But uh, again, he's another one where surrounded by some elite receivers. You know, probably, Stephen, I, I, I'm i kind of talking myself out of this. I, I think you probably nailed it here with a four, just given, you know, that's kind of I'm not an anti-Jackson Dart by any means, but he he has been. I don't want to say he's held him back because he's played he's played quite well, but in big time games he has come up short. This is a season where they're obviously they're, they're calling it last dance down there. They got all the chips on the table. I love saying that about Ole Miss, but that's what it is. So it's going to come down to games like LSU on the road. It's going to come down to Georgia at home, Oklahoma at home. Jackson Dart cannot have an egg in any of these big time matchups, even, even at Florida, who knows Florida, Stephen and I, I'm starting to talk Stephen into Florida is going to be better than, than people <laughs> think. Uh, not that they're going to be a, like a playoff team, but yeah, crazier things can happen, but who knows? I, I just point being, I think that at Florida is going to be a big game for Ole Miss potentially as well. We need Jackson Dart to step up in these games. If we're going to realize these 
high expectations, making the college football playoff, potentially competing for a national championship, Jackson Dart has got to be playing better than he ever has before. I think if you wanted to take the optimistic angle on Ole Miss and Jackson Dart and the quarterback, he did, like we said, he did get better from 2022 to 2023. And also I think there should be some faith in Lane Kiffin, Charlie Weiss Jr. um, to be able to take that progression up a notch this season. You add in Juice Wells to go with Trey Harris now. So now you have Trey Harris, Juice Wells, Jordan Watkins, and Caden Priestcorn. That's a pretty potent group of receivers that Ole Miss is going to be trotting out there uh, this season. So I, I think the trend line is one of those things like the trend line for Jackson Dart seems to be going up. And to me, like if you wanted to make the case that maybe he's not as important, it would be that if you had to win a game, I think Lane Kiffin could find a way to get enough out of Walker Howard for a couple games to keep the playoff push alive. Right. All right. So who is your most important rebel this fall outside of the quarterback position? I'm going uh, Walter Nolan. I, I think you, know, you and I have talked all off season that you know guys like Walter Nolan and high impact defensive linemen they don't get in the portal very often. So when you can get one, they're going to be starting and expected to make a big time impact right away. And let's be honest too. I mean, the Rebels didn't have somebody who could create havoc like him uh, in the middle of last season. So a chance for him to come in and build on what he did at A and M. I think Walter Nolan uh, could really make a big difference for the Ole Miss defense. Yeah, and that's. You're such a smart guy, Steve, and that's exactly where I went. We can <laughs> we can make the case Princely too. They they need help off yeah. the, the edge. But yeah, to your point, uh Ole Miss, ninth in the SEC in run defense. When you look at yard, they allowed four yards per carry uh, per average there for the opponent, and that was fifty-third in the country. To realize all these lofty expectations, we've got to become a lot better defending the run, and that's gonna start. With the monster in the middle, Walter Nolan. This is another guy. Money year for him, Stephen. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 a little weird to be talking defense when it comes to Lane Kiffin's Ole Miss program. But again, that we we've got not that they were awful last year, but we, we have got to be one of the better units, I think, in the SEC if we're going to win it all. And and I think that is realistically on the table for Ole Miss. And it and it to me, it starts with Walter Nolan. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Like the, the defense cannot be, it doesn't have to be like Georgia good. It just needs to be a lot better this year to be able to make a push. Because if they if they are better this year, there's a good chance that Ole Miss is going to win some games in the college football playoff. I think Ole Miss is going to add a running back in the portal, maybe two. But you could also make case that Ulysses Bentley is pretty dang important right now because they don't have anybody else behind him. I mean, they've got some other, I know they have some other guys, but in terms of proven running backs, uh, Bentley's up there right now with Quinshot Judkins hitting the portal to Ohio hey, State. Cousin Nick, a Mississippi State fan, he says, Ole Miss going to choke on all that rap poison. So <laughs> let's do Mississippi State next. I, again, we're kind of assuming that Blake Shapin will start at quarterback. What what would you grade his value one to five to the team next fall? I went with four because I don't think there's really any other option right now for Mississippi State. Uh, you know, Chris Parson, Michael Van Buren, Jeff Levy handpicked Blake Shapin in this portal cycle to be the starter. So I, I think given that and the fact that there's inexperience behind him, he's got to be high in the, in this rating. Yeah, I yeah, I, went, I was close. I said three, Stephen. That's kind of where I put him. Because, again, I don't know quite what the expectations are. I think he'll come in. I think he'll be solid because I think that's what Jeff Levy does. He works with these quarterbacks and he gets them to, to play their best football uh, but again, I, I'm just, I'm just so unclear, but get, he has to be at least a three given the options behind him. I know they, they've got the young Van Buren you mentioned there, very promising future perhaps for him in this offense. But if he's our day one starter in the SEC, we, we probably got some real issues. Yeah, especially with all the new faces that uh, right. Mississippi State has, you probably you need somebody with experience to kind of come in and take that job, and if nothing else, just sort of guide this program to the transition this year that's probably going to be in twenty twenty four. So, who's your most important bulldog this fall, Mike? I this was the team that I had the toughest time <laughs> finding a most important player, just because there was so much turnover at Mississippi State. But I'll throw maybe a little bit of a curveball here. What about Ethan Miner? a center he's transferring in from North Texas. Uh, you know, in terms of advanced analytics, he was one of the better centers in the American athletic conference last season, three year starter 
Mississippi State needs guys who can sort of steady kind of things up front with five new offensive linemen. So I think starting center, guy who's experienced, who can maybe start in the middle in the SEC, uh, I think Ethan Miner would be my most important Bulldog right now. Ooh, and then <laughs> I hope this guy's still on the team, Steve, because I've, I honestly, I forgot to double check. But uh, how about Mike Wright? Is He's still with us, right? Yes, he is. Okay, uh, but... Yeah, just what he'll do. And again, I don't think he's clearly. Here, here's the thing with Mike Wright, Stephen. I mean, th- I saw it all last season at Starkville. I saw it at Vanderbilt, too. You get a taste of him, and you say, man, this guy, he's a game breaker. He could, you know, he's the reason we beat Kentucky. He's the reason we beat Florida. You know, he 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 can add something to this potent Zach Arnett offense. And then you throw him in there, and you're like, oh, my God, this guy. What is he doing? So, again, small doses. If he's your starting quarterback, we're in real trouble. I don't even know if that's the position he's playing anymore. So I, I'm putting him kind of as an athlete. But I think we got to get him the ball. We Throw it to him. Uh, reverses. Let, let him take wildcat snaps and, and just pray that he doesn't have to throw the football. But we got to get him involved in, in kind of similar things that I said about uh, some of these other guys. He, he's got to buy in. He's, he's an older guy. He's seen – college football, I, and I thought, I mean, I was stunned when he left Vanderbilt because he'd probably be Vanderbilt's starting quarterback today, probably should have stayed. But he has been part of a rebuild there in, in Vanderbilt, and, and he kind of saw that to the height, <laughs> as sad as they were under Clark Lee, beating a couple SEC teams. If he can do that for Jeff Levy and, and be a force for getting a couple wins, however they got to do it, heck, they. I mean, imagine, let's hope this doesn't happen. I hate to even suggest injury, Stephen, but let's say an injury happens as a quarterback, they may have to go like triple option or something. And, and who else to put back there than, than Mike Wright to do some crazy s- stuff back there. So uh, I'm, this is the ultimate wild card, but I think Mike Wright will have a presence, if, if nothing more than leadership and, and hopefully some explosive playmaking this fall in Sarkville. I think you're absolutely right, because I think when you just look at what Mississippi State lost, like Woody Marks is gone. Uh, Griffin, Thomas, uh, Freddie Robertson at receiver. You lose four out of your top five statistical receivers last season and your best running back. You've got to find playmakers from somewhere. Like the points have to come from somewhere. And I think there's a lot that you could do. I mean, Jeff Levy being that kind of creative offensive mind, if you can just find some ways to use his all-purpose ability, uh, that's only going to help Mississippi State trying to claw its way into a bowl game. That Every resource uh, to that six win mark and, and finding ways to get someone like Mike Wright involved. Uh, they have to do it. He's just, he's almost too good of a, of a, of a, a kind of athlete difference maker to keep on the sidelines. Yeah. All right, Stephen, how about uh Mizzou level of importance, Brady cook for this football team next fall? I'm going five. Uh, I think getting drew pine as an Arizona state transfer helps but Missouri's thin at quarterback. We saw the growth and development that he had last season for Missouri. So I think just, uh, he's got to be a five for me, just too important. Yeah, that's exactly what I said, Stephen. And, uh, you know, one thing that has got me a little hesitant now, and and again, we got Pine coming in, all that, I get it, but a big part of Brady Cook's game is running the football. Uh, So I'm a little concerned about, you know how much we're going to be asking him to do that. Surely the first couple of weeks, we may not, heck, the first month of the season, we may not need him to run the football, but come SEC at A&M, at Alabama, Auburn at home, Oklahoma at home, at South Carolina, Arkansas at home, uh, we're going to need him. You know, you can't go into these football games and, and have, a, have a leash on your quarterback, so to speak. Yeah. So. I'm a little concerned, but the expectations should be sky high for Missouri, should be college football playoff. I'm even crazy enough, Stephen, to say I think they could make the SEC championship. So if they do that, they ain't going to do that, Stephen, with Brady Cook not performing at an elite, elite level. So when I'm when I'm projecting them that high, I'm saying I think Brady Cook could be a Heisman Trophy contender type you know, if Mizzou wins 11 football games or more, who knows? Uh, he, he's going to be in that conversation, I, I really do believe. Yeah, I was going to say, you can't keep your quarterback in bubble wrap if you're Missouri when you play Alabama, when you play Texas A&M, or just an SEC play. I think the first month of the season, I think it'd probably be wise to sort of save some of that wear and tear in him 
till you get into the heart of the season. Though the way you kind of started that made me think that you were rethinking your Missouri to the <laughs> SEC championship game and you went with the injury. So uh, I, I was all prepared to have like a, a correction moment, but uh, I guess uh, I guess we're still on track, right? Right. So who who is the most important non quarterback for Missouri this year? I'm going Luther Burden. Uh, I know Missouri's got other receivers, but he's just so explosive, so dynamic. He's a difference maker. Whether it's him running the ball, special teams, catching it, uh, just a five star first team All America type player for me. So uh, give me Luther Burden. Yeah, that's exactly where I went as well, Stephen. And again. To my point, again, I uh, I may be a little too high on Mizzou at the point in time, but if they're going to deliver on all this hype, they're going to need arguably the best. He could be the best overall player in all the college football, but certainly the best skill player, I think, Luther Burden, all the things he does, special teams, offense, running the ball, catching the ball, obviously. And, and who knows uh, any other ways we can utilize Luther Burden. we got to do it this fall. Get the most out of, out of him while we can because he is off to the NFL as a top 10 pick uh, in, in 2025. So Luther Burden, Brady Cook, interchangeable when it comes to elite high-end players that could both be Heisman contenders next fall if Missouri is as good as I think they can be. Let me throw – how about let's throw this curveball out there. Luther Burden had seven rushing attempts last season. In order to maybe save some wear and tear on Brady Cook and also get your best player involved. Now, granted, you don't want him to be taking 15 carries a game. But if you're Missouri, seems like with Brady Cook having 113 carries last season and you want to get rid of 30 or so or 40, I don't know. I think I'd find ways to get Luther Burton more involved in the run game. Just a just a theory. To save, right. Uh, and and just tear. lining him up all over the field so they right. can't jam him and things like that. And yeah. You, Suddenly you put Luther Burden in the backfield, all eyes are there. Next thing you know, uh, you know, Marquise is blowing past the second day. Right. So, I mean, there's so many different things you could do with that. But, yeah, I, I certainly think all that will be realistic. All right, how about uh, Oklahoma, Stephen? Where, on a scale of one to five, importance for Jackson Arnold this fall? I think it has to be a five because Oklahoma with Casey Thompson is slated to be the backup quarterback. He's also coming off a knee injury at FAU, but it's not necessarily just about the, the whole depth chart. It's just that Jackson Arnold, if, if they are going to exceed expectations this year, it's gotta be on his shoulders um, because the offensive line is a question. He's a breakout candidate, all those things. Uh, Oklahoma's all in on Jackson Arnold. They could have kept Dylan Gabriel around, but I think it's Jackson Arnold's time to shine. That's why he's gotta be a five for me. Mm, he's got to be a five. He's a three, Stephen. <laughs> but just because if they had a, you know, I, again, I, I think Sooner fans are just dead tired of talking about the offensive line. But if if we had a veteran group, if we had, you know, if, if we knew what we had in our offensive line, so to speak, we know what we got in the offensive line, coach. But what if, what if this offensive line is just awful? Which I'm not yeah. saying it will be, but that could happen, right? So, um. I, again, I I see your points for the, for them to have a big breakout. He he's got to be a solid player. You know, the flashes he had in the bowl game, we got to see that. Not the mistakes that we saw in the bowl game. But I write that off as a true freshman making his first start more than anything. So I I get where you're going with that, Stephen. But I th I think it's got to be more about the players around Jackson Arnold this fall stepping up. I think it's a little unrealistic to put it all on on a true sophomore breaking out. So I, I, I put it at a three for Jackson Arnold. Yeah. Maybe I'm too high. Maybe I'm too high. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, I, I, I could be persuaded to go a little lower here, but I think to your point, um, Oklahoma, they could a couple things. I think they could meet their preseason or exceed their preseason goals. If Jackson Arnold just has this unbelievable statistical season or, the offensive line plus a pretty solid uh, Jackson Arnold comes together. I, I have big questions about their offensive line, and I know you and I have talked about that a lot. But I do think, regardless of their offensive line, I'm, I'm very high in the upside of uh, Jackson Arnold this season. So, who do you have as the most important non-quarterback for the Sooners? I'm going to go with Danny Stutzman. Uh, I just first of all enjoy watching Danny Stutzman play ball, uh, just uh, all over the field, kind of prototypical uh, linebacker. But also, we saw Oklahoma. That from a defensive standpoint last season, they gave up 30 points a game in 2022 down to 23.5 last season. So the defense is trending in the right direction. Getting Stutzman back uh, 
to you know to a guy that could have went to the NFL, I think is a, good, is a big deal for an Oklahoma defense moving to the SEC. Yeah, I, that's exactly what man. We're starting to get too too much I like here, Stephen. But yeah, I think Oklahoma's defense. You know, there's not a lot of. Uh, yeah, there's a couple. Georgia comes to mind, but I don't know that there's going to be many high end defenses in the SEC this year. I think it's more the offensive once again. But yeah. I I think the exception could be Oklahoma with Brent Venables leading the charge. Some of the key pieces they got led by Danny Stutzman there. So yeah, give me him. I think if we can come into the SEC and have one of the better defenses, which I think they will have probably a, a top four defense in the SEC, I think that'll be huge, and that'll give Jackson Arnold and that offensive line time to, you know, or or at least not have pressure to where they got to come out here and score 40 points per game to, to win um, and, and give that offensive line time to gel, give Jackson Arnold time to – get some experience in a, it's not a completely new offense, but it is a new offensive coordinator. So uh, I'm looking this to be more of a defensive team. That's kind of a big piece of the, why I went with Danny Stutzman. Absolutely. And also I think this is where the Brent Venables hire is probably going to pay off for Oklahoma as it moves to the sec, like being more line of scrimmage defensive oriented. Lincoln Riley was very good at finding ways to score points, but you have to have a complete team coming into the sec. So I, I think this is where we'll start to see year three under Brent Venables, the way the kind of tide turning to put together one of the better um, defenses in the sec, throw out Billy Bowman too, and Peyton Bowen, uh, two outstanding defensive backs that Oklahoma has. I mean, from just a returning production standpoint, Oklahoma's defense is in really good shape this season. Yep. All right, Stephen, how about South Carolina st- quarterback ranking? And again, we, we don't know who it's going to be necessarily, but let's just assume it's a Lenora Sellers. I think most people agree it'll, it'll probably be him. I know they got Robbie Ashford as well as uh, Dante Reno, Luke Doty, but let's just assume it's Sellers. If, if it is, grade his importance to the football team on a scale of one to five. I went with four. Mm. Maybe that's too high. <laughs> Um, I'm kind of questioning myself as I talk through this right now. <laughs> I, I, I think it's it's kind of goes back to the thought that I have on South Carolina, which is I think you know what you have in Robbie Ashford. I think he could be solid kind of in short doses, but I think for South Carolina to sort of reach its goal, exceed its goal, it needs Lenora Sellers to have a big season and also to be probably the most important player for the team. So I went with four. <laughs> Cam Newton 2.0, according yeah. to Steven over here. Let's just throw it on a guy that's not done it short of the Vanderbilt game in junk time. But give me a two for Sellers. Because, I, again, I think we don't even know he's going to be the starting quarterback. I I think it's a safe assumption at this point in time. Uh, I, I'm kidding, certainly, about Cam Newton. But I have heard he's, you know, he's got the he, – he's he looks the part, anyway, of, the, of that type of imposing physical presence. He's going to run the ball a ton. Still unsure, you know, how well he can threaten SEC defenses with his arm. And, and no one, quite frankly, will know that answer till he actually has to do it. But uh, mm, I, I don't know. I, I think putting too much on him is a mistake, but I'll be happy to be wrong here, Stephen. But g- give me a two because I, I think I think it's got to be the the all the pieces around him to, to kind of elevate him until we know what we have in him, if that makes sense. Is there a game of bigger quarterback mysteries than week two of <laughs> Lenora Sellers going on the road to play Kentucky and Brock Vandergriff? One guy will be anointed a hero. <laughs> yeah, right. One guy will be anointed a complete bust and get him off the field. You know, what? At, at the end of the game, the, the better quarterback gets a pair of shades. At the <laughs> <laughs> so who do you have as the most important game cock? That's not a quarterback. You know, Mike, I almost went with insert your pick as offensive or defensive lineman <laughs> here for South Carolina, but I went simple. I went Rocket Sanders. Uh, mm. you know, we saw this offense last year for South Carolina struggle to get consistency and production from the running backs. And we saw two years ago, a healthy Rocket Sanders was a potential All-American. So I think you add your, if you're South Carolina, you're getting a high end productive player already in the sec at a position of major need even if it isn't one that has a lot of positional importance necessarily i just think rocket sanders could be really important to this team well once again steven great by heads think alike and yeah i i think rocket sanders he was my selection as well 
Hopefully we're getting back to what he was two years ago last year, you know, battling a ton of injuries. But uh, I believe, again, I, I should probably look these things up before I just say them, Stephen. But I think he led the SEC in yards per game two years ago. or, or it, it may have been second. He, he was up there. But, I mean, he is an elite high-end player when he's running well, when, it, when they – are actually blocking for him, unlike they did last year at Arkansas. But I, I think these are the players that we're going to need to step up around Sellers to, to give him some time to develop, if that makes sense. And um, if they get the the old Rocket Sanders, I, I think they're going to they're gonna, they, he's going to have to be a workhorse for this uh, South Carolina offense. Absolutely, um, uh, Rocket Sanders was second in the SEC in 2022, and Mike Wright led the SEC in uh, <laughs> rushing yards per attempt at 7.3 back in 2022. But yeah, I, I think you just think about what happened last season, the revolving door, the injuries they had. It feels like South Carolina has got a number one running back that it can lean on now in Rocket Sanders. Yep. All right. How about uh, Tennessee, Stephen? Where, scale of one to five, how important is Nico to Tennessee's success next season? I think it's got to be a five. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be happy to be talked uh, talked down from this number, but I just think when you think about what Tennessee could be offensively, if Nico is the real deal, and I think he is, um, I, I think automatically they're better than last season. Joe Milton, two up and down. Don't think it was all his fault, but Nico could be pretty special. So I just think five, and also you think about what the drop off to the next guy could be. I think it's pretty steep for Tennessee. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say, Stephen. <laughs> though, it, for those that don't know the. The backup's a walk-on, Gaston Moore, and they also got a true freshman they really like, Jake Merklinger, but it's like, well, it's a little bit different than uh, the $8 million man back there. So, yeah, Nico, give me a five for Nico. Just critically important. And, and heck, Stephen, we even saw last year, I mean, there were not nine football games, but that felt like a disappointment, and it was with, again, not horrible quarterback play, but just less than expected, and, and that's – you know, this this Tennessee system is so quarterback-friendly, but quarterback-driven as well. Really need Nico to step up if they're going to challenge in the SEC to potentially make a college football playoff run. Uh, they won't do it with Nico holding them back, so to speak. It, they, yeah. They'll need him to step up to beat the likes of Alabama, uh, Georgia, yeah. uh, Florida, which that's kind of sad to say, but it, but that's Tennessee's history right there. So Nico has got to live up to the hype if Tennessee is going to be really good this year. It's it's like if you start the sentence, Tennessee makes the college football playoff if it's Nico lives up to the hype. There's really no right. other way around it because, I mean, everything about this Tennessee team, the schedule's pretty favorable. There are some question marks, obviously, on defense, but if Nico hits – with that supporting cast, the offensive line and receivers they have, I mean, this that offense is good enough to carry them all the way to the college football playoff. So who's your most important ball that's not a quarterback? It's got to be James Pierce for me. Uh, I just think when you look at Tennessee's defense and not a lot of proven difference makers right now, um, especially they just lost their leading tackler. They're down to just three returning starters uh, for this season. But not only that. At a position of, I think, great importance, line of scrimmage, 14 and a half tackles for loss. He gets to the quarterback. I think James Pierce could be a preseason first team All-American and probably should be. So um, I got James Pierce. Pretty easy pick for me. Yeah, that's exactly where I went before I uh, shout out uh, Cousin Matthew. Stephen, he's just hoping we don't get – South Carolina doesn't get screwed by injuries this year and we make a bowl game. Love the show. Keep up the great work. So I appreciate you, Matthew, for those kind of words. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it is James Pierce. It's got to be. And, and, again, Tennessee's defense held him back, You certainly. I, I think that's fair to say at times. But if you got a monster pass rusher th that is coming off the edge, that is affecting games like he did against Iowa, he was making big-time plays against Alabama. Uh, again, that was another one where the offense just didn't quite do their part. Uh, James Pierce really started to come on late in the season. He's getting all this hype. He's going to be a first team, probably all American, Stephen. But a, a a game wrecker like that can not make the entire defense elite, but can be a he can be a game plan wrecker in, in a tune that that can win you a game like Alabama, like Georgia, like a Florida, all, all those NC State that we just threw up there on the screen. Uh, you know, if he's got a big big time performance in a critical game, 
that could be the difference between making a playoff or not. This this may seem a little weird to say this, but I also I think about players like James Pierce and I think about how Tennessee plays, about how it could just be one or two defensive stops because they're probably not going to have a shutdown defense. But if you can get off the field on third downs, that's having a good pass rusher, getting stops in the red zone, somebody into the game, getting to the quarterback and forcing a turnover. I mean, you think about, you know, in the NFL, how many times did someone like Aaron Donald or TJ Watt, not comparing them, but you think about clutch moments and guys who could really make a difference. Well, James Pierce is one of those guys in the SEC that if Tennessee needs one play on defense to win a game, I think you feel pretty good about him coming off the edge and creating some havoc, which helps Tennessee secondary get off the field. Yep. All right. How about uh, Texas, Stephen? How it grade the importance of Quinn Ewers on a scale of one to five? I'm changing my pick because we, so he's going to be better than Peyton Manning, Arch Manning. That is. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> I I went with three for Quinn Ewers, kind of middle of the road here. I think Arch Manning is going to be good in time, but I think at this point, Ewers, I think Sarkeesian believes is clearly the better uh, option for his team at this time. Like what Ewers did last season too. Got better 2022 to 2023. Quarterback rating up by 20 points. Accuracy jumped by 10 points. And that was with playing more games uh, last season. So I think we went with a three for Quinn Ewers. Mm, I'll go a hair more, Stephen. I went with a four just because of all the pieces that have that are going on in the NFL off that Texas offense. So I, I think it's going to you know, more of the responsibilities will be shouldered by Quinn Ewers. He's at times he's been spectacular at times inconsistent. We need Quinn Ewers in an SEC schedule. They were having a battle before Stephen about how easy this Texas schedule is. And said, well, how the hell can it be an SEC easy schedule? It, that thing we were told didn't exist. I, I don't necessarily buy the narrative that it's easy. Uh, again, Michigan, I think they're they're obviously catching a huge break. Harbaugh left, twenty some odd players <laughs> leaving yeah. the team. So uh, I get that part, but I, again, they're, they're going to be favored in a lot of these games. But Oklahoma, that's to me, that's a toss up. And just look at last year as further evidence of that. I think Georgia, even though it's in Austin, favor Georgia. Uh, Florida, again, I think Florida is going to be a lot better than people think I would f- certainly favor Texas and Austin, but that to me is not a gimme at Arkansas. I'm over the moon on Taylor and green. And last time we played Arkansas whooped us Kentucky. Let's say Brock Vandergriff is better than expected. I mean, that's not a gimme. And then at a and M, I mean, I, I, I could, you could talk me into four losses there, Steven. I'm not sitting here predicting it, but I'm just saying this is the sec and it's going to, you know, the first month is going to seem like a cakewalk. And then the next month is gearing up really quick on you. Yeah. Mi- minus Vanderbilt, Mississippi State. It, who it, And Mississippi State, if this was the Dan Bullen era, Stephen, Mississippi State would get you. You know what I mean? But this is year one, Jeff Levy, totally new roster here. But that, that, there's, there's no guarantees other than those two, I think, in the conference play. Yeah, I, I think the, the theme that comes to mind when you're thinking about like SEC play for Texas is like a road trip to Arkansas late in the season. We saw what happened last time they went to Fayetteville. We'll see what Arkansas looks like. But if, if Arkansas is a little bit better than maybe we think, all of a sudden you don't think the Razorbacks are going to be uh, fired up for, for Texas. They like to welcome them to Fayetteville. And they ran into a buzzsaw last time. They could do the same thing this year. And then you get that rivalry game against Texas A&M that the Aggies have been waiting for. So I think that this schedule in terms of just a, a draw, not having to play Alabama, no Ole Miss, no LSU, that's favorable. But I also think there are some, to your point, I think there's some other landmines here that may not may may not seem that way at first, but I think once you dive into the schedule a little bit, it is a little tougher, I think, maybe than just easy. And so who is your most important non-quarterback for the Longhorns? I've got Kelvin Banks, uh, the left tackle. Uh, this I think this could be one of the best offensive lines in college football this season. Uh, four starters back this year for the Longhorns. Banks has played nearly 2,000 snaps in his first two years at Texas, and he's allowed just three sacks in, in that play. So he's been really effective as a, a blindside protector for uh, Quinn Ewers or whoever the quarterback has been for, for Texas. So coming into the SEC, you got to have studs on the line of scrimmage, and Kelvin Banks is one of them. 
Well, unfortunately, Stephen, we've been somewhat anticlimactic to, as we inch towards the end of this list because that's exactly what I have with, uh, you know, we got to protect the blind side here. Of course, maybe we just allow Quinn Ewers to get obliterated so we can have uh, Arch Manning, the best Manning yet. He's going to be 20 times better than Peyton and Eli put together and Arch, Arch, uh, the original Manning that down there. But in all seriousness, yeah, I mean, this is a line of scrimmage league. We all know that. Texas is going to find out all about that. Of course, they showed at Alabama all about that last year. So we'll we'll see. Calvin Banks, they're saying, you know, top 10, probably even higher if he lives up to the hype in the 2025 NFL draft. Let's see what he's all about going up against these elite pass rushers week in and week out in the SEC. We have got to keep our quarterback upright. Quinn Ewers, I, you know, I said he was inconsistent. I believe he's been injured too uh, every year down there yeah, in Texas. So it's true. we have got to keep him healthy if we're going to make us a deep run, and it's always got to start with that all-important left tackle. So give me Kelvin Banks, most important Longhorn. I'll throw out two more guys that I considered. I think Anthony Hill, the linebacker for Texas, could be a real difference maker this season after a strong freshman year. Also, Jade Barron, a uh, defensive back who kind of can play sort of a versatile jack-of-all-trades role. We know Texas had some issues last year against the pass. Uh, he's one of the veteran uh, guys coming back in the secondary this season. Yep. All right. Last and kind of least, sadly, uh, Stephen Vanderbilt. Uh, again, I don't. We don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Technically, I'm. I'm going to go Diego Pavia. I, I think that's who it'll be. But uh, scale one to five, rate his importance for the Commodores. I went with two, only because I think at this point it's it, Pavia was very good against Auburn again when he was at New Mexico State. Over the course of a full SEC season, I think there's, it's fair to have some questions. I think Nate Johnson also, power conference experience at Utah. I think Vanderbilt's probably okay if they had to start either one of them. So I went with two. I went with one. <laughs> Just because, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the impact. I, yeah. You know, again, fun player. Um, I, I We had someone on the other day. Steven Stats, a war, anybody, if you missed it, Parker Fleming, he, he basically said, I don't know what this guy's going to be, but he's going to be fun. So yeah, on a, for sure. on a fun scale, let's give him a 10. But uh, his importance, his value to Vanderbilt, because I don't even know how often, I assume he's going to start. But again, don't know. Give me a one until further notice. And uh, I'm just kind of throwing my hands up in the air because I don't know what, what in the world to do with Vanderbilt. Uh, who, who's your more, most important Commodore? I went with CJ Taylor. I think versatile defender, um, maybe one of the few all SEC defensive players that Vanderbilt will have this year. You know, we'll see if the Ricky Wright comes back, but you know, Mike, you and I have talked about all off season that Vanderbilt needs to find something to lean on, whether that's a standout defense or figure out something offensively. You know, I think CJ Taylor kind of using that versatile role could be one of the better kind of pieces to the puzzle for, for Clark Lee. Uh, I think kind of stuffed the stat sheet last year too with some sacks, interceptions, pass breakups. I think he's got to be the most important pick for me. I went with uh, running back Seth Alexander. So thankfully we disagree on this final <laughs> one here. But, you know, he was a breakout player last year, one of the uh, best freshman runners, probably the best freshman runner now that I think of it uh, in the SEC, at least most underrated, just kind of went under the radar because it's Vanderbilt. But he's a fine player. I think he's going to be the workhorse of this offense year two in Clark Lee with uh, hopefully we get us an SEC win somewhere on the schedule. Yeah. But uh, this this was a tough one, but I, I kind of just went with a guy that I think is going to be the most productive for the Commodores, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good pick, especially for an offense that is losing a ton at receiver. And I think there's still some question marks about that group and, and even what they brought in through the portal. I think it's one of the few knowns right now for Vanderbilt's offense, they could, especially under ran under some really difficult circumstances in a struggling offensive line. I know he had, had less than 400 yards, but I think he could be a, a centerpiece for that team this year. Yep. All right, Stephen. Hey, we went over 90 minutes here. SEC action. Uh, you got any closing thoughts before we hop off the line? I, I hate to go back to what we talked about at the start, Mike. I've got my eye on the transfer portal these next, uh, you know, kind of two weeks to see. It's kind of the last chance for all these teams to find 
replacements, try to find, fill those last roster holes. I know there's probably going to be some more movement after uh, next week's spring game. So I think the biggest theme for me is uh, keep an eye on the portal because it's kind of the last chance to improve a team. And we'll see if there's any big names that enter uh, over the next couple of days. Yeah, and do it quickly so Stephen can finalize the Athlon College <laughs> right. Football Preview right. Magazine, yeah, which please. will be hitting the shelves <laughs> fairly soon. So, uh, Stephen, before you go, tell everybody, if they don't know by now, where they can follow you and where they can find your work. Absolutely. So you can follow all my work up at AthlonSports.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at AthlonSteven, and at the YouTube page, all CFB 365 All right, Stephen, well, I appreciate you, as always. So informative. Always enjoy these conversations. Can't thank you enough. And I can't thank enough all y'all, the audience, if you're here, uh, still listening again, 90 minutes of free content. Hit that like, hit that subscribe, share the podcast, get it out. Word of mouth is a great way to grow the show. But I thank each and every one of you for tuning in, especially those on the live show. We'll catch you on the next one.